Okay, so I think it's about time that we get started. Hi and welcome everyone uh, to this webinar on the IBP implementation stories on applying global WHO abortion care guidelines in local settings. Next slide, please. My name is Carolyn Ekman and I will be moderating this session today. I work for the Prevention of Unsafe Abortion Unit at the Department of Sexual and Reproductive Health and Research, including HRP, at WHO in Geneva, Switzerland. I also represent the IBP network, which is based at the same department at WHO. Uh, and this is a network that's dedicated to knowledge sharing of family planning and other SRH interventions that have proven to work. If I can please ask everyone who's not speaking to mute Hello, themselves, sister. that would be great. Thank you. Okay, next slide, please. So uh, as someone who's dedicated to communications, knowledge sharing and research dissemination in SRHR, I am really thrilled today to have all of you here uh, to listen in on um, uh, of this exciting project uh, about implementation stories. Uh, this is a joint project between the Prevention of Unsafe Abortion Unit and the IBP network. So as you may know, um, yesterday was International Safe Abortion Day, and that is the day when we also launched the abortion implementation stories that we will be discussing today. The reason I find this project so very exciting is that it's because it links WHO's evidence-based recommendations with local NGOs' use of these recommendations at country level, as well as the art of storytelling as a means to share the impact of this implementation. Next slide, please. But before we dig in any further into this topic, I just want to go over some housekeeping rules. So this webinar will be recorded and we will be sharing this link uh, after um, this session. Uh, we do offer interpretation to Spanish. So if you want to listen to this webinar in Spanish instead of English, you can uh, simply click on the interpretation icon in Zoom. And we will dedicate some time to questions and answers in the end. So uh, we do invite you to post any questions at any time of the webinar. Um, and we will try to address some of those at the end. If you do want to write down a question, please do so using the Q&A function. You can see an icon here on Zoom saying Q&A. Please use that rather than the chat. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. So on that note, I would like to introduce my colleague, Ulrika rienström loy She's a technical officer at the Prevention of Unsafe Abortion Unit at WHO, where she provides country support, preparing research papers, policy briefs, and other strategic documents for information sharing. Before joining WHO, Ulrika was deputy representative for UNFPA in Lao PDR. Ulrika has spent more than 13 years with UNFPA and WHO in SRH programming, leadership, representation, and coordination in several countries. Ulrika is a qualified midwife with a master's degree in public health, and she holds a PhD in medical science from Karolinska Institute in Sweden. Next slide, please. So thank you so much, Caroline, for the introduction. And uh, I would like to start to, to ask you all if you really knew the statistic uh, about uh, induced abortion. Did you know that uh, three out of 10 pregnancies end in an induced abortion. And 45% of all abortions are unsafe. And almost all of these unsafe abortions, they uh, occur in low and middle income countries. And induced abortion is a, is a very simple and common healthcare procedure. An abortion is healthcare and safe when it's carried out by using a method that is recommended by WHO, uh, when they are appropriate to, to the pregnancy duration, and by someone with the necessary competencies. But however, when women with unintended pregnancies, they face barriers to, to actually access and obtaining quality abortion care. So they also often then reach out to unsafe abortion methods. So to give some, next slide please. And to give some background and information about this project, in March, 2022, the WHO re released an updated guideline on abortion care that includes over 50 recommendations 
spanning from everything from clinical practice, service delivery, and also law and policy. And this guideline updates replaces now the recommendations that were in three previous WHO guidelines. And the new one presents the complete set of all WHO recommendation, recommendations and best practices relating to abortion. And this guideline is aimed for a wide range of stakeholders, everything from uh, policymakers, program managers, NGOs, professional associations, and health workers, of course. And the guideline emphasizes on quality of care and that abortion not only needs to be safe, but also timely and affordable, respectful and person-centered. So while legal and regulatory, regulatory and policy and service delivery context can be different from country to country, the recommendations in WHO guidelines and the best practices described they aim to enable evidence-based decision-making and with respect to, to quality abortion care. Next slide. Thank you so much, Ulrika, uh, for that introduction to the WHO abortion care guideline. So while we know that much effort goes into developing and disseminating WHO guidelines, there is still limited documentation of how this evidence is actually concretely used in countries and also limited documentation on the actual impact of such implementation. And this is a gap that IBP Network has attempted to address. Um, and this is also why we initiated this implementation story project. We asked ourselves, how can we capture how global recommendations are actually used? Uh, so that local knowledge about what actually works gets shared with others in the SRHR community. Because of course, knowledge and evidence has little value if it's not understood and applied. So how can this be done through stories then? Well, to give some reflections on this, I would like to hand over to my colleague, Abraham. And I will see first if he can hear us because he had some technical issues just now. Abraham, are you able to hear us? And can you speak? Abraham. So there seem to be some technical issues when it comes to Abraham's microphone. So maybe what I propose that we do is that we can uh, jump to the next speaker and then perhaps we can bring in Abraham at a later stage of this session. So if we can go to that, yeah, to next slide, please. One more. Great, thank you. Okay, so um, yes, I was talking about kind of like bridging the gaps between um, evidence and, and actually implementing the evidence. Um, and that's why IBP initiated the Implementation Story Project back in 2020, actually. We had a vision to capture real life examples on how WHO guidelines and other evidence-based tools in SRHR have been used on the ground. And the first outcome of this project was 15 stories that we published last year uh, in collaboration with our partners at Knowledge Success. And these stories highlight successful interventions in family planning. The response was overwhelmingly positive. And because of that, we decided that we wanted to repeat this concept. And so last year, we launched yet another call for stories and this time, we asked for experiences of having used WHO guidelines on comprehensive abortion care. Next, please. Next slide, please. So we received 43 submissions, and out of those, we selected five organizations who received support in translating their experiences and their knowledge into captivating stories. To support them in this process, we uh, gave each organization technical support from IBP and from the uh, Prevention of Unsafe Abortion team. Uh, support on how to convey this knowledge and data using language and visuals that are easy to understand and that are captivating. And since we know that documentation and communication projects require resources, both when it comes to time, but also uh, through material resources, each organization also received financial support in the form of a smaller grant of 
2,400 US dollars, which they could uh, choose how they wanted to, to use uh, in any way to support their storytelling process, whether that would be to collect photos uh, for capacity building in the organization or any other investment. Next slide, please. And the result of this process was launched yesterday, as I said. Five touching and inspiring stories highlighting different aspects that are addressed in WHO's recommendations on abortion care, spanning clinical care, information, service delivery approaches, and law and policy. We are extremely proud to present these five stories. They are from uh, five different organizations, namely PROM6, uh, sharing how they advocated for legal and dignified abortion in Peru. We have a story from Pro Familia in Colombia, describing how they transformed their organizational culture to eliminate health worker stigma and to ensure that clients received respectful abortion care. Our third story is from Reproductive Health Uganda, showing how they used peer learning, male champions, and a one-stop facility model to prevent unsafe abortions and to increase uptake of post-abortion care, including post-abortion family planning. And last but not least, we have the two stories that we will dig, uh, dig deeper into today. Uh, Vitala Global, uh, sharing how they developed an app to support self-management of abortion care in Venezuela. And then we have Hidden Pockets Collective, showing how pop culture and social media can be used to challenge abortion stigma in rural India. Next. So using the power of storytelling, all these five story briefs exemplify how evidence-based interventions have improved equitable access to abortion care that is safe, but also timely, affordable, person-centered, and respectful. And not the least, these stories highlight real people and what access to quality abortion care mean for women and girls, their health, their well-being, and their futures. Next. So on that note, I would like to present our, our first panelist, Athira Purushottaman. She is an activist and head of partnerships and communications at Hidden Pockets Collective Trust in India. She has spoken on, on a variety of panels on SRHR, both nationally and globally. And she is passionate about developing content in local languages and ensuring that non-English speakers have access to reliable information about sexual and reproductive health and rights. Uh, Athira, I give the floor to you. Please share your story. Thank you, Carolyn. I appreciate the introduction. It's great to be speaking with all of you today. And a good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining from. Uh, I represent Hidden Pockets Collective Trust. And uh, Hidden Pockets Collective Trust is an India-based uh, charity organization. We work on sexual and reproductive health and rights and abortion advocacy. Uh, next slide, please. I'll be speaking about uh, Hidden Pockets latest campaign, which is developed using WHO guidelines. The campaign was focused on one Indian state, which is Bihar, and we selected four districts to run the campaign. Uh, the campaign is called Ab Ab Safe Hey, which is Hindi for Now You Are Safe. Next slide, please. So India has national policies promoting sexual and reproductive health and rights, but it remains a taboo subject for most people. Premarital sex is highly stigmatized and contraception use also is stigmatized in India, uh, which causes reluctant to seek sexual and reproductive health care and uh, sexuality education is not part of the school curriculum and young people resort to uh, online sources, married friends, uh, cousins, or family members for SRHR related information, which potentially expose them to unreliable information. Next slide, please. While the technology and knowledge on uh, how to perform safe induced abortion exist, deep rooted cultural norms and uh, Deep-rooted cultural norms about sex and sexuality cause great barrier to uh, 
seeking abo quality abortion care. Cultural attitudes often lead to biased and non-evident-based practices and behavior among service providers. A lot of service providers and healthcare workers believe it's their duty to involve the family members of uh, abortion seeker. Despite it being illegal to request consent of a family member or a partner, if the abortion seeker is above the age of 18, such barriers contribute to delays in abortion, uh, quality abortion care, and sometimes uh, it chamber with the legal aspects of it. Next, next slide, please. At the beginning of the lockdown in 2020, abortion was not even in the list of essential services in India. While the pandemic led to a rise in unplanned pregnancies and unsafe abortions, some women were forced to continue with their unwanted pregnancies due to uh, loss of income, travel restrictions, and healthcare sector's attention shifting to COVID-19 completely, uh, which led to abortion and family planning uh, centers and clinics being either converted into COVID-19 centers or completely being closed. Next slide, please. These are a few photos from Hidden Pockets Collective's workshops and training. We have uh, conducted trainings and workshops for paramedical students, uh, young people, adolescents, married and unmarried women from the targeted locations. And these are a few photos from there. Next slide, please. The highlighted red area is the ca target campaign location that we selected, uh, which is Bihar. Prior to the COVID-19 outbreak, Hidden Pockets Collective, uh, we started developing a campaign, Abab Safe Hey, as I mentioned, which is Hindi for You Are Safe Now. The campaign targeted young people as well as healthcare workers, and we intend to, to uh, improve understanding of clinical and legal aspects of uh, abortion and to empower young people with uh, raising awareness and uh, letting them know about their rights to sexual and reproductive health care, including safe and uh, legal abortion services. We choose four districts of Bihar for the campaign and in these selected areas, uh, there was strong adherence to deep-rooted cultural norms and uh, which is coupled with uh, a lack of information in local language, which greatly contributed to particularly high number of unsafe abortion. And the campaign was uh, launched in the middle of the pandemic, which first made it uh, impossible to arrange the planned face-to-face -face information dissemination. Uh, we had to redesign the campaign uh, through a combination of virtual and face-to-face -face activities. Hidden Pockets Collective uh, developed a range of uh, material, including songs, podcasts, videos, and training material, which was shared through various social media channels and uh, traditional and physical training sessions and workshops. Next slide, please. By uh, referring to data and evidence-based recommendations from WHO, we could uh, build credibility and ensure that reliable information reaches their target audience. We use uh, the mentioned WHO guidelines in the design and implementation of the campaign. And throughout the process of developing the campaign, it became apparent that there was a great need to adapt the implementation of the guidelines to the local context, including the laws and cultural factors of India. For example, all information was developed in the local language, which is Hindi, and the information was framed in ways to uh, confront and encourage questioning of uh, locally common misconceptions, myths, and norms. While cultural norms were recognized as barriers to safe and respectful sexual and reproductive health care, a deep understanding of the local lifestyle, habits, and preferences also provided to be uh, a key to a successful campaign. Next, next slide, please. Uh, we pro uh, produced a uh, podcast series which uh, where young people shared their own stories about their experience with sexual and reproductive health care, menstrual health, and access to safe abortion. Our community outreach coordinator visited local service providers and NGOs uh, that were already present in the area, and we invited them to uh, collaborate with us and uh, participate on our trainings and workshops. Next slide, please. 
we focused on educating young students and uh, collaborated with many colleges and universities and uh, conducted online and offline workshops. Uh, we also conducted workshops for young married and unmarried women. Next slide, please. Uh, face to face training on sexual and reproductive health and rights, including comprehensive abortion care, was offered to nursing and paramedical students as a part of the campaign. Uh, we also offered workshops to healthcare workers commonly present in rural India, which are ASHA workers. They are accelerated social health activists and Mamda Didis. Uh, Mamda Didis are the healthcare workers with a role which is similar to that of a counselor. Uh, and they are present in all the healthcare facilities in Bihar to provide maternal and child healthcare. The sessions were designed based on WHO's evidence-based clinical guidance, included uh, training on how to prevent unintended pregnancy through contraceptive use, uh, how to prevent unsafe abortion, and how to identify and treat signs and symptoms of complications of unsafe abortions. Uh, the training received many positive feedback from uh, attendants, attendees, and uh, many of which were unaware of the legal aspects of abortion in India. Next slide, please. Hidden Focus developed a song uh, as a part of the campaign. So this is an insight uh, resulting from Hidden Pockets Collective's uh, research was that Bollywood has a huge impact on young people in rural India. In an attempt to tap into the local habits of consuming information, Hidden Pockets Collective developed a song in Hindi uh, the song is called Pingi Kare Sawal, uh, means Pingi asking questions. Uh, we developed the song with the help of Bihari lyricists and composers who are very familiar with the music taste of the target group. The song emphasized the importance of safe abortion and sexual and reproductive health care. It was released on 28th September 2021, the International Safe Abortion Day, as a part of an event that took place both uh, online and offline. Caroline, uh, would you be able to? play the uh, song one minute. that we learned uh, from running the campaign in Bihar, that uh, we have to acknowledge the fact that there is a lot of information available in English, but when you work with the rural and underprivileged communities, it's always better to use local language campaigns and also understand the information con uh, consumption habit of the people. The same kind of campaign that may work in a city doesn't necessarily work for work in a rural area. So we had to design the campaign in a way that which is very, uh, very much feel local, locally produced. Even it is very visible in the song that we produced. It's a uh, very Bihari and Bollywood kind of music. Uh, so we also made sure that we use uh, the 
locally used social media platforms because uh, when we choose Bihar as the targeted location, we realize that running digital campaigns in Twitter or on Instagram doesn't necessarily reach the target audience. So uh, we did a social media research and realized that a lot of young people from uh, Bihar doesn't use Twitter or Instagram. Rather, they use the Indian social media platforms like uh, Taka Tak, share chat josh so uh, we made sure that our campaign is uh, compatible with those social media platforms and we run campaigns in those indian social media platforms as well and uh, we also realized that creating awareness alone uh, will not help in reducing stigma or creating awareness about uh, safe abortion services doesn't necessarily mean that everyone will go and uh, access safe abortion services it's very important to make sure that uh, there is a reluctance to use public health services because people usually think that if it is free, it, it is not good. So people don't usually make use of public health centers or government hospitals. So we have to uh, make sure that these public health centers are of good quality and people trust uh, the system. So these are the lessons that we learned from uh, the campaign. Thank you. Thank you so much, Athra. That was so inspiring and, and fun to watch. And I think uh, everyone will remember this song now and, and, and probably uh, most people hope that they could actually listen to all those five minutes of that video. <laughs> uh, but we will share the, the presentation later so you can get the link uh, to the song. And of course, you can also find the, the link to the song in the, um, in the actual implementation store that you can download. So uh, this brings me to our second panelist, um, Rupan Gill. She is a obstetrician gynecologist with expertise in family planning and abortion care. She holds a master's in public health um, in global health from Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. And she has worked as an emergency obstetrician gynecologist in Nigeria and Yemen. And she's also worked in Malawi, Chad and Pakistan. She has previously also worked with WHO, providing technical expertise to the Department of Sexual and Reproductive Health and Research. And she was on the evidence review team for several WHO abortion guidelines, including the recently launched abortion care guideline from this year. Rupan co-founded Vitala Global in 2020, based on her experiences working in the field uh, as an ob obstetrician and in her research and divorce with global organizations. She has had a number of media appearances with the most recent in Forbes as one out of five, one out of seven female founders. Over to you, Rupa. Thank you very much. I'm hoping everyone can hear me okay. Uh, thank you. It is my pleasure to represent our partners, Venezuelan grassroots organizations, our team, and all the Venezuelan women and girls who have played an important role in building and sustaining Ayabon Beagle. Next, please. This is Sexy Bell Braco. She was 24 years old and the mother of three. Uh, last year in a New York Times article, her story was shared to really highlight the, the, complex, the complexities that Venezuelan women are facing. As a young Venezuelan woman, she was, she was living amidst the economic crisis. She was unable to afford basic necessities, let alone a contraceptive method of her choice. She was pregnant and sought an abortion through a clandestine clinic. The abortion was performed with a hook, which punctured her uterus and she hemorrhaged to death. Globally, every 23 minutes, a woman dies of an unsafe abortion, a cause that is entirely preventable. We created Aya Contigo specifically for women like Flexibel. Next, please. Why Venezuela? Well, firstly, Venezuela is a country that has been facing a protracted humanitarian and economic crisis, failing healthcare system, poverty, scarcity, restrictive abortion laws, criminalization of activists, stigma, the COVID-19 pandemic, misinformation, lack of judgment-free compassionate care, and isolation. Our journey in Venezuela started with, with trust, actually, that was established amongst key partner organizations in Venezuela who had an intimate knowledge of the context and envisioned a joint objective in exploring the possibility of a co-developed, co-designed digital solution that could facilitate self-managed medical abortion and contraception care. Next, please. At Vitala Global, building solutions with the local context in mind centered around reproductive autonomy is a core value of ours. 
bridging abortion and contraception, restrictive settings and challenging contexts, and open access harm reduction digital tools is our focus. As such, Aya Contigo was designed, tested, and implemented in an iterative manner, being flexible to pivot when needed. We have been intentional in our aim and through access, and though access is important, our ultimate aim is to empower women themselves so as to be agents of change in their lives and ultimately their communities. Next, please. In former method, we're committed to six design principles that run through every product we co-design with women and people of childbearing potential and their communities. These design principles embody the Vitala Global Values to ensure that we are equitable, inclusive, authentic, credible, results-driven, agile, and female-led throughout every aspect of our work. We are deliberate in ensuring that we stay true to our motto of local solutions for global problems. Next. Our design principles guide our research process, which includes a rigorous three-phase human-centered design and research methodology. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we had to pivot from in-person research to fully remote. And this was done through the use of social media and various virtual modalities to connect with our partners and Venezuelan women themselves. The following provides you with a sense of what our co-creation process is like. However, what I want to emphasize is that through our learnings in conducting ethical research remotely, we were able to collect even more data than we had expected and, were, and we were able to successfully execute each phase of our patient. I'll buy, I'll buy patiently. <laughs> Next, please. So, Aya Contigo. Aya Contigo is a mobile application that was co-created with over a thousand Venezuelan women and a dozen grassroots organizations over the course of one year. It is your safe abortion and contraception digital companion with offline capability, WhatsApp notifications, and live chat support. Aya accompanies women and girls to safely self-manage their medical abortion process in a supported and judgment-free manner. Throughout the entire process of co-designing and developing Aya Contigo, our, our team was intentional and mindful of incorporating the WHO um, abortion guidelines from content to design to implementation. Next. There are three ways that I Contigo supports a Venezuelan women's journey. So first of all, by providing her with the information and support to have a safe abortion, Assist, with her, assist her with her contraception decision-making and connect her to our trusted network to navigate the healthcare system and access resources. Next, please. In addition, and a core component of AYA, which ran through our uh, research amongst all our users, is to be able to provide our users with psycho-emotional support and an option to stay connected with us through our live chat or WhatsApp notifications. Throughout the research process, particularly in phase three, at that time, Aya Contigo was simply an app providing information. But through our pilot testing, it became evident that people also needed to be able to connect with someone that was a real life person. It also gave us insight that digital is not the panacea. It needs to be integrated and connected amidst the feminist ecosystem and the formal healthcare system of a given country. Next. So Aya Contigo is more than an app. Truly, we feel that it is about building a movement. It is bu building a community. Aya is a digital, a com comprehensive digital support system, and it is accompanying Venezuelan women who would otherwise resort to a clandestine abortion. As mentioned, it's embedded within the existing feminist ecosystem in Venezuela. We have the mobile application, which is offline completely. But in addition, we have an AYA care team, which is basically local Venezuelan staff that are available to support people in real time and accompany them and provide them emotional support. And that chat is embedded directly within the app. And then we also have a community engagement team also led and um, uh, the team that's on the ground by local Venezuelans. And the whole intention behind that is that we really need to continue to sustain and build the trust and for the folks that are uh, in Venezuela to see Aya Contigo as a Venezuelan tool, not a Vitala global tool. To date, Aya has supported 1,600 plus Venezuelan women since our launch March 2022. Um, next, please. 
So not only is it about Iacondigo and the digital solution and providing the safe quality abortion care to Venezuelan women themselves, but by Tala and Iacondigo, we are committed to empowering local voices. And you can see this here in the team that we have built over the last year. As such, our Iacondigo team consists of young Venezuelans and Latinas with diverse backgrounds and skill sets. Um, vast majority of our staff uh, greater than 50% actually are under the age of 30 and vast majority are Venezuelans or Venezuelan migrants themselves. Next, please. So why could Aya Contigo be a game changer? Well, what we've realized is that it is transforming misconceptions and is something that can reduce costs and resources compared to traditional models of care. And we're generating evidence through our processes to show that quality digital, digital solutions co-created with communities can be implemented to scale and particularly in some of the most challenging contexts globally. Next, please. We have learned a lot while being on this journey. In our, in our, implement, in, in our implementation story, we highlight these key tips for SRH implementation based on our experiences. And some of these are listed here and they include listen to and learn from women and organizations in the community, co-design solutions with the end users, be patient in building trust and be reactive and ready to change your plans. Next, please. Our story, though rewarding, has come also with its challenges and some of the important lessons are highlighted here. Um, I won't read them out as they're also listed in the implementation story, so you can download that and, and access those there. Next, please. We are extremely grateful to our partners. We now have a network of over 20 grassroots organizations and Aya Contigo has been recognized by major feminist movements within Venezuela as part of the movement itself. However, this work would not have been possible without the trust and relationships we built with our partners who have been with us since the beginning. For example, Grand Challenges Canada, the Options Initiative, Foss Feminista and Plafem. When all we had at the beginning was a general idea, but none of us had any idea what truly was about to materialize. Next, please. So storytelling, it has become a large part of our strategy. We have been inspired by the process we went through with the IBP network in telling our story of Aya Contigo. We believe that through storytelling, we can highlight the deep impact that Aya Contigo is having in Venezuela. We are supporting Venezuelans to access safe abortion care and empowering Venezuelan them, Venezuelans and Latinas themselves to be agents of change as they work with us to improve and expand our work across Venezuela and beyond. At this time, we would like to share an animation of a true story of one of our users that was collectively, collectively created uh, and envisioned by various members of our team. So if uh, Nandita, you could play our story, please. Carmen se nos acercó cuando estaba esperando su ecografía y había decidido usar las pastillas, pero pensaba. ¿Qué tan seguro es? ¿Voy a necesitar atención médica? ¿Con cuántas semanas se hace? ¿Qué puedo comer? ¿Se sangrará mucho? ¿Y si me da fiebre? ¿Alguien se va a enterar? ¿Qué va a pasar? ¿Esto está mal? No es el momento. Simplemente no lo es. Es mucha incertidumbre y no hay nadie con quien hablarlo porque su compañero no va a estar con ella. Aunque él no esté en desacuerdo con el aborto, tampoco sabe sobre el tema. Carmen iba a tener este proceso sola, pero nos encontró. Navegamos la incertidumbre con ella y guiamos el barco para que evitara chocarse. Ofrecimos información para que no se agotara en el viaje y hablamos de lo que sentía para que pudiese drenar. Aunque no había otra persona físicamente en su casa ese día, en ningún momento estuvo realmente sola.
you. Next slide, please. So yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you to the IBP network. Um, and please follow us and get in touch. Our details are here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rupen, and thank you so much also, Atira, for those two rich and inspiring examples. If we can move to the next slide, please. Um, I think your two stories really illustrate how evidence-based recommendations coupled with, with deep understanding of the local context can really make a difference in the lives of women and girls. Um, we do have some time for questions for our panelists. So uh, we don't have so much time, so I will just jump right to the questions. Um, my first question goes to Atira. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about how you use WHO guidelines to inform your projects? Sure, uh, thank you for the question, Carolyn. Uh, the curriculum, which was designed based on WHO's uh, evidence-based clinical guidance, including the clinical practice handbook for safe abortion uh, included training on how to prevent unintended pregnancy through contraceptive use and how to prevent unsafe abortion and how to identify and treat signs and symptoms of uh, complications of unsafe abortions. And based on references to uh, World Health Organization's abortion guidelines, the curriculum incorporated the importance of access to abortion care being equitable, inclusive, and people-centered by referring to recommendations um, in which abortion guidelines, it's, uh, we identified that uh, relevant topics and developed evidence-based messages to the uh, messages to be shared on social media platforms and on our workshops. Great, and, and using WHO guidelines and referring to WHO guidelines, how, how do you see that that played a role in how your intervention, intervention was uh, received by target audience in the community? So WHO is a widely trusted source of healthcare recommendations in India. And uh, by referring to data and evidence-based recommendations from WHO, we could build uh, credibility and ensure that reliable information reached the target audience. And in the design and implementation of the ABAB Safe Hay campaign, uh, several WHO guidelines on abortion care were consulted and uh, for example, uh, healthcare workers' role and oops, I think we lost. No, she's muted. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Now you're back. Thank if you can maybe repeat the the last sentence. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, in the design and implementation of the campaign, uh, we used several WHO guidelines on abortion care, which is mentioned on the uh, implementation story. Great. Thank you, Atira. So my next question goes to Rupan. Um, I mean, I think both your story and, and the Hidden Pocket story, um, um, you know, they're, they're really creative and, and, and inspiring examples of, of proven impact when it comes to improving access to, to abortion care that is safe, but also person-centered. Um, but of course, a single abortion intervention cannot exist in, in silo. So uh, my question to, to you, Rupan, is how do you see that Aya Contigo complemented other existing services in the community? And, and my second question would be, are there any additional components that, that you feel are needed to support your initiative to really ensure an enabling environment for comprehensive abortion care? Thank you so much for that uh, question. So yeah, um, you know, it's interesting because when we embarked on this journey, we did have the question, a general question, you know, would a digital solution um, be feasible and acceptable to facilitate self-managed abortion in Venezuela? But through our, our process, our, you know, very intentional human-centered design process in our, in our own internal research, and also in terms of the, in the, trust building, I really wanna emphasize that because that has been a key aspect, I would say, of our work that really highlights and allows us to uh, appreciate the landscape. And so through Aya Contigo and our re research, we've really realized that it's playing an important role in the existing Venezuelan landscape. And that by building that trust and really understanding the context of how is it, how are feminist organizations on the ground um, supporting people through their harm reduction models? And then how are, 
larger sexual and reproductive health services that are also providing harm reduction, counseling, working within the formal system, how are they functioning? And then how are these people talking to one another? And so what we noted is that um, our app was really leveraging the work of organizations by linking our care seekers with existing services. But we were also in, in this really interesting place where we, you know, we're working in a very restrictive setting where we're also safeguarding our users and as well as safeguarding our, our, um, our local partners. And so we're supporting women in this, in accessing timely, timely or person-centered abortion care. And also because of the nature of the, di the, the digital nature of the product, um, some of our local organizations, they were actually really excited about the, this, this opportunity because they can't be in multiple places at once. So in a lot of ways, we were enabling organizations to be able to help more women. And also we, it was allowing uh, these organizations to guide several women in parallel. So what, this may not have been possible and particularly around COVID-19 pandemic to do that face-to-face. And also in a country like Venezuela, which also many other countries um, face a similar challenge is that you have, you know, rural communities and people that are in, um, not necessarily in the greater urban areas. Uh, I think you had a second part to that question as well, but I, I don't know, I think I may have addressed that. <laughs> I think you might have uh, partly touched on that. Yeah, my, my second question was really about, um, you know, if you saw any additional components that are needed to, to support, uh, your your intervention, your app, uh, and and you know to really enable create an enabling environment for uh, safe abortion. Um, by, yes, by yes. Think. Oh, well, I can say one one thing I would like to like just highlight on that point is that um, you know we've been talking a lot about this internally amongst ourselves because, and I think you we've highlighted even this webinar that access access is one piece of the the situation, right? It's like we can give we're giving people access to safe abortion, they're getting the information, but it's the first step in bridging that gap. Um, you know, there's issues around supplies, there's you know issues around really bridging that and, and exactly that enabling, the enabling system that can really ensure safe, respective, respectful, compre comprehensive abortion care so that we are staying authentic and true to this whole concept of reproductive autonomy. So we wanna be able to provide this and make it available to all who need it without discrimination. So we need well-functioning and supportive health systems that are supported by laws and policies that promote and protect sexual and reproductive health and human rights. I think that's a really great uh, point that you're emphasizing there. There's a lot of different components that go into creating this enabling environment for comprehensive abortion care. Um, my, my last question to you is, I'm, I'm curious because you were, you were um, mentioning the power of storytelling in your presentation about how you've been inspired throughout this process to, to sort of think of how you can use storytelling. Um, how do you uh, envision that you will now use this, this story now that uh, you have sort of synthesized and, and translated your experiences into uh, the storytelling format um, how do you see that you will use uh, these story briefs moving forward to to amplify your message and, and in your work to uh, to improve abortion care for uh, access to abortion care? Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, we've been thinking about this as well. And I, there's two pieces. There's a piece around our users, um, the people like Venezuelans themselves, and then as we expand I contigo throughout the region, it's user facing, and then also for partners and other donors and as a fundraising tool. So I think that the power of uh, this type of um, storytelling and storytelling strategy is a twofold thing. So in one way, we're gonna use it a lot in our social media strategies and reels and posts um, and highlights to really get more users coming to Aya Contigo, but it also is going to reinforce already uh, the credibility about Aya Contigo within Venezuela because many people are aware of WHO and World Health Organization and particularly in a lot of these settings they use these guidelines and so the fact that we're um, you know been recognized and these organizations as partners have been recognized it will really amplify our work and more users will trust it and more partners will trust it. And then the second piece of it is as a marketing tool. So we'll blog about it on our websites. We're going to generate more trust from um, uh, potential users, but also partners. And then share this work with folks who are not traditionally part of the humanitarian development space. So we as Vitella straddle two worlds. We're doing the humanitarian development work, but we also talk a lot to folks that do a lot in the femtech space. And so it's also a really useful thing, I think, as a bridge to um, communicate about the type of work that, that is being done. 
that sounds really great and, and exciting that you that you think that these stories can help to reach uh, new and broader audiences. That's really fantastic. Um, if we can move to the next slide, please. Uh, I'm afraid we won't have time to take any more questions. We're starting to run out of time. Um, we've reached the end of the, the this webinar. Um, and now that we've dedicated this hour reflect, reflecting over the power of a good story, um, I would like to remind everyone that, of course, the stories are of little value if they're not read uh, or listened to and if they're not shared. So I do encourage everyone here to uh, go to our website and download and read all the full five stories. They are extremely interesting and touching, um, I dare to say, um, and also to share them widely. Next slide, please. So all the five stories are available in PDF format. You can download them um, from this um, web page here that you see. We will also um, share some material to everyone who's registered to this webinar, so you will get all the links uh, later. Um, on the RVP Network website, you will also find the 15 stories of family planning that we launched last year. Next slide, please. And for those who found this interesting and are curious to learn more about storytelling and how you can um, apply that in the space of SRHR, um, IBP has a lot of different resources related to that, uh, including blog posts, articles, and tips for creating your own story. Um, and I should also say that last week we hosted a webinar uh, related to a photo story project and how to use photography as a storytelling technique to communicate on sensitive SRHR issues and in particular abortion. Um, so uh, with all the links that we're going to share with you, we'll also share the link to the recording of that webinar, which I really encourage you to, to listen to if you did not attend last week. Next slide, please. So speaking of resources, I should also point out that all of these stories that we've talked about today um, they describe interventions that were initiated before 2022. So they refer to WHO guidelines that have now been replaced by our updated abortion care guideline that was launched in March 2022. So if you have not already, I do advise you to familiarize yourself with our updated abortion care guideline. It's available in a PDF format and in a digital interactive format. And um, you can see the link there as well. Next slide, please. So on that note, I really would just like to thank all of you for taking the time to join me today. Uh, I hope you will enjoy the stories, read them, share them, be inspired by them, and think about how you can apply storytelling yourself in, in your work to improve access to, to abortion care. 